gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Father, for just the grace, Lord, that you have allowed for us to experience, Lord. Truly, Lord, that we cannot live this life. There's nothing that we deserve. It's only through Christ, Lord, who lives in us, Lord, that we can actually go through this life, Lord. And so, Lord, this is us, Lord, claiming that we surrender everything to you, that we need you, Lord. And so, Lord, we thank you for this morning that you've allowed for us to just wake up once again, Lord. Thank you for this air that we breathe. Thank you for the relationships that you have blessed us with. Thank you for the gift of family. Thank you for the strength, Lord. Everything, Lord, we are just in awe, Father, of your goodness and your kindness to, to each, each one of us this morning, oh God. And so, Lord, we are excited as well, Lord, for what you have in store, your message, Lord, for all who is in attendance today, Lord God. So we pray, Father, that you let your Holy Spirit just work in us, Lord. Convict our hearts, Lord God, to just receive your word and not just receive it through our minds, Lord, but even through our hands, Lord, that we will obey, Lord, whatever you will uh, command us for this morning, O oh God. So, Lord, we thank you. We glorify you. All honor, glory, and praise to you and to you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Praise God. You can now take your seats. So once again, good morning, uh, everyone. So just to give us a minute to set it up here. All right. So good morning. Good morning, po. Yeah. Parang ano? Ako lang po yata ng pandesala. Good morning once again, everyone. For those of you guys who don't know me yet, my name is Ron. Uh, that's short for Ronald. Uh, I am a campus missionary, by the way. I am uh, in full time, okay, but although every one of us should be in full time ministry, but just to be technical about it, I am in full time ministry. So that means as a campus missionary, I work with the youth of our church and, of course, our city. That's our Elevate, Elevate Baguio, all of our high schools and all of our, actually, the ones who played here a while back, that's actually Elevate. Yeah. So praise God for the lives of those young people. And, of course, uh, if you don't know yet, we have actually merged into one service, uh, all of our high schools, all of our college, and even this time with all of our big, you no know, B1G, all of our singles, and all of our young professionals. So if you are a student, high school, college, or a young professional, not yet married, that's what I, that's what I mean by that, uh, we invite you to come and join us every other Saturdays at Ion Hotel, 4 p.m. for our weekend uh, service. If you are not yet attending with us. And once again, uh, it's really truly a privilege from the Lord to be up here once again and to be used by God as his mouthpiece uh, for his message for all of us, not just you. you know, I may be the one standing here in front, but you know the message is also for me. You know, not just for you, but also for me as well. And before anything else, before the message, you know, next week is a very special week for us. Okay? It's a very special week. Why? Because we are celebrating our 39th year of God's faithfulness and goodness as a church here at CCF. And of course, that's 39th for the whole CCF movement. But of course, here in Baguio, we are celebrating our 16 years. Imagine that. We are 16 years. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And we are simultaneously uh, going to celebrate this, of course, with all of our brothers and all of our sisters all over uh, our satellites, both nationally and, of course, even uh, internationally. So, make sure, make sure uh, to invite your family, make sure to invite your friends, your classmates, your co-workers, your boss, make sure to invite. Pastor Peter will be speaking for us that day via live stream. Okay, so, <laughs> so live stream with I. But of course, we are also preparing something, of course, locally here uh, at CCF Baggy, we are also preparing something special no, to celebrate also our 16 years of existence as a church. So please tell your seatmate, kindly tell your seatmate, I will see you again next week. Yan. I will see you again next week. Wag kang absent. Sabi mo sa kanya, yan. Wag kang absent. <laughs> All right, so if you are new to church, if this is your first time or it's been quite a long time that you haven't joined us, we are continuing our series in uh, the book, which actually is not a book, it's just a love letter, right? A love letter from a loving 
discipler, Paul, uh, to a church which we call as the Corinth, the Corinth Church, you know, the Corinthian Church. And we are continuing this series which we call as What's Wrong With Us? And there's a lot of things that is wrong with us, right? Here we are hoping that as a church, you know, modern church right now, here as a church, we are hoping that we will really get to learn you know, from uh, this church, the Corinthian church, uh, which of course Paul planted in the first century. And as we have seen in the first three chapters of our study of the first of first Corinthians, and if you are familiar with the story of how this is uh, as a church, the Corinthian church, you know that this is actually a messed up church, right? This is really a messy church. Like it had the appearance that this is a church that in the facade, outside, outwardly, it was doing okay. Like this is a church that it appears to be a successful church. And worse is actually they appear to be spiritual. But then again, as we will see in, the, in this series right here, this is actually a church that is rotting from the inside. And it is eventually actually leaking out. And the sad thing is that many of the members of this church, the Corinthian church, is that they are either in denial or just simply they are completely clueless that they have actually a serious problem, this church right here. You know, if there's a book, since, right, we have studied that the, Cor the Corinthians, they love knowledge, right? So maybe if there's a book, I just saw Bea here, if there's a book that they will publish, no? If there's a book that they will publish, it would have been this book. The Beginner's Guide on How to Destroy Your Church Real Quick. That would have been a bestseller during that time. Because that's what they're actually doing. You know, that's exactly what they were doing to their church. Aside from all of the wrong theology that has in, been incorporated in their church, right? There's a lot of issues of pride and relational issues of this church. There's a lot of problem. And they are definitely destroying their church real quick. Real quick. And, it's, and, and that's not the only problem. The problem is, the, the, the main thing as well is that they are not being a good testimony, right? Can you imagine that this is a Jesus follower church, that this is a church and that's what's happening inside the church? So wh what would the people outside of that church tell about God himself? What would the people outside would tell about Jesus, right? This is, they are not being a good testimony to the people uh, around them. So today we are going to be on chapter four already. And you know, as I've read, through chapter the whole chapter four and as i've studied this there's this one verse that actually in a sense really convicted me there's this sense that really ministered to me and somehow it also encouraged me and i would even say that this verse that this verse that the lord has really led me to i think this could summarize very much what paul really wanted to say in the corinthian church in chapter four what's the message that paul is saying i think this is really summarized in this one sentence in this verse in chapter 4. Here's what Paul says. For the kingdom of God, meaning the church, for the king, kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. I mean, one liner, but so powerful, it just contains a lot of things that we have to unpack today. For the kingdom of God, for the church is not a matter of talk, but of power. What Paul is saying that the church, you know what? The church, even our modern church now, it's more than just preaching and teaching. Yes, it's preaching and teaching is part of it, but church is not just that. That's what Paul is saying here. That it is more than just what? The use of putting someone here on the pulpit and then making him use persuasive words so that people would really come and join the church. No, but what Paul is saying, it's more than just being a good speaker and being a good persuasive talker. That's what Paul is saying. The church is not a matter of talk, but of power. What Paul is saying here is that, that a church would not be considered really a real church. A church would not be considered a church without the presence of God. Because the power that he's talking about here is the Holy Spirit. That's the very presence of God. You know what? A group, do, you know, do, you, 
Do you know what we call a group of people talking about God without the presence of God? If we gather, if you gather a group of people and you talk about God, but without the very presence of God, do you know what's that called? That's called religion. That's called religion. And that's what's happening in the Corinthian church. And that's a warning for all of us today, right? That's a, that's a warning for all of us today. You know, just to make this point a little bit deeper, these photos right here that you see, this was taken during uh, both of which uh, were taken a year apart, both of which are during our anniversary, Elevate anniversary. Uh, the one on your left is 2022, and the one on your right is just this year, a few weeks ago, 2023. And you know, uh, uh, both of which, by the way, I was praying before I, I speak. And you can see here that there's really not much difference. But you know, aside of course from, uh, I have a K-drama bangs here. <laughs> That's what you get when you get uh, fashion advice from a Gen Z. Okay. <laughs> so I have to put it up because I'm with the adults today. Okay. But you know, there's really a main difference between these two. I mean, it might look like same, same celebration, might look like I'm praying for both, but there is really a big difference, I tell you, at least for me personally in my heart during these times way back in 2022 and this time in 2023. You see, last year was really a tough year at, at, for me, no? It was really a tough year for me, especially in the ministry. I was going through uh, some struggles in terms of my emotions, uh, there's, there, there are relationship struggles uh, in the church. There's spiritual struggle that I have. And to be honest, that year, 2022, especially the early years, uh, the early months of that, I was really rethinking if this ministry is for me. I was really this close to resigning during that time. It was really a tough year for me. And this, this picture right here, I was praying from a position of I was really empty inside. Like like nothing. I was really empty inside. I was tired. I was so tired in the ministry. I was so spiritually dry. And to be honest, I was so detached from the Lord. And it's only through God's grace that even my condition was like that. It's only through God's grace that the result was this. This was 2022. Praise God. Now I can tell you, you know, those, those claps that you're doing right now, I cannot claim it for myself because I don't have anything to offer during that year. Like nothing, empty. So I know that that is the work of the Lord. And you know, for this year, if you take a look at the result of this year for our Unite, it's this, this year. Thank you, Lord. But if you take a look at from all the angles, all the metrics, like the number of people, 2022, 2023, it's almost the same. Like people would come up to me, hey bro, ang ganda ng message, powerful message, powerful testimony, 2022, 2023, no, not much difference. The celebration, the preparation itself, they said, no, 2022, it was a beautiful celebration, 2023, it was a beautiful celebration. So in a sense, 2022, 2023, the result, it's the same. It's comparable. It's almost the same. But the main difference was, was at least for me this year, I did not miss the blessing of the Lord. I did not miss the blessing of God's presence. That made a very big difference for me. I literally felt God move during our celebration just a few weeks ago. Last year, you know, I was operating... Uh, on empty. I was relying actually, no, literally, I tell you this, I'm being vulnerable to you. I was relying on my skills because I know I have skills and I have gifts that the Lord has given to me, but I was really just relying on all of those. Then I, I'm just hoping that Lord, sana I don't mess this up. Yun na lang yung prayer ko during that time. I, I was relying on that one. But this time, this year, you know, I know that God was, there's this, this overwhelming sense of peace and comfort and security that the Lord has given me this year, I know that the Lord is there. And I did not miss the blessing of God's presence. And my point is this. That's why I'm sharing you this. 
you can be in the midst of a successful ministry and yet you miss the, the blessing of the very presence of God. And some of you, you are there right now. You can be in, in the midst of a very successful ministry that in terms of number, in terms of resources, like it looks so good. But you are missing, like people are blessed by your ministry, but you, you are missing the blessing of the presence of God. That's what happened to me. And in the same way, in the same way that you can practice religion without really having a relationship with the Lord. That is very true as well, right? I mean, that was the very situation that I was in last year. And that is this very thing right here. That's also the situation of the church in Corinth. And again, that could be where you are also right now. Now, in another letter of Paul, he, he wrote another letter to his, one of his uh, disciples, Timothy, which happens to be, by the way, Timothy also helped in the Corinthian church. And there's this warning, some sort of warning by Paul to Timothy. Take a look at this one. Here's what Paul says to Timothy. He says, mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People, take a look at the highlighted words. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good. I mean, if you take a look at all of those descriptions, by the way, especially the highlighted ones, that looks like the Corinthian church. It seems like Paul was really describing, okay, Timothy, this is what you're gonna get. As you help me with the Corinthian church, these are the people who are there. And Paul is not done yet. He says, treacherous, rash, conceited lovers of pleasure rather, rather than lovers of God. And you know, this one right here, I hope this, this really hits you hard as well as it hit me hard. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. You know, again, this was the very characteristic of the Corinthian church. And if we're going to be honest, this is where some of us here are right now. That we are in church, but there is just no transformation. You have a form of godliness, but there is no power. In other words, you might be in ministry right now. You might even be leading one. You might be even a D-group leader, or you might be a D-group member, but you are operating because of your gifts and your skills. Because it's just, so you were exposed in that ministry, or you know a lot of Bible uh, verses and all, and you are operating on that. But you have a form of godliness. It appears that you are spiritual, but there is no power. Some of you, you might be there right now. And for some of us, you might be sitting here or you might be attending with us for quite some time and you see church as an avenue to cleanse your conscience every Sunday. Like that's what church is for you. Like ah, I, I, I need to go on Sunday kasi ang dami ko nang ginawa nang from Monday to Saturday, kailangan ko nang maglinis ng, ng Sunday. Because that could be where you are also right now. Like you have a form of godliness, but there is no transformation. Like you've been hearing truths of His Word, every messages, every Sunday, Sunday in, Sunday out, but again, a form of godliness, but no transformation. There's no power. And as we will go through the whole chapter four uh, of First Corinthians today, you know, there will be some hard lessons. Actually, ito pa nga lang, di ba? Parang ang bigat-bigat na. Parang, oh. <laughs> there will be some hard lessons that you will see here. There might be some truths that are even so difficult to swallow today. I tell you, I'm one with you. I really had a difficulty swallowing the word that God has prepared for all of us today. But, like it, like, it will really go against your ego and your pride. That's what's going to happen today, this morning. But my prayer is that this morning is that you would hear the message today as 
how Paul said it to the Corinthians. I pray that this is how you would receive it. Because the last thing I want for you, for you, uh, uh, the last thing I want for you to happen today is that you will leave this and you're just feeling guilty and you're feeling defeated after the message. No, that's the last thing I want uh, uh, to happen. Now, I would want for you to hear the message just like how Paul says it. I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I admonish you. I pray that that's how you would hear the hard truths of the message for this morning. You know what? What, what Paul is saying here, for short, what Paul is saying here? He's saying, guys, I love you so much. That's why I need to rebuke you. That's why I need to say these things. You know what? I love you so much. That's why it, if it comes to a point that I need to discipline you, actually in the latter part of chapter 4, he talks about weeping them. Yeah. Like using the rod to discipline them. Of course, he's saying that metaphorically. But, but, but what he's saying is that, you know, I love you so much. That's why I need to say these things. I need to discipline you. This is not out of anger, what I'm going to tell you right now. This is out of love. And for those of you who are parents like me here, you know what I'm talking about, right? There are some hard truths. There are some things that you need to say to your children. There are some things that you need to do to your children so that, right, they will be out of danger because they cannot see that they are actually in danger. Are you doing that because you're just angry? Of course not, right? Because you love your children so much, that's why you need to say all of these things. And that is the heart of Paul, and that is the heart of God for each one of us today. That you will receive the word as a loving word from a loving father. No, that's what I pray today. So, towards the end of this, no, there is something very controversial. There is something very, let's say, borderline scandalous, okay? A little bit controversial that uh, Paul says in the last line, uh, in the last, yeah, the last line of verse 16 here. Here's what he says. So I do not write these things, sorry, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I admonish you. Then he says this towards the end. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. Parang ang yabang ni Paul, no? Parang, wow, ikaw na. Ikaw na mabuti, ikaw na magaling, di ba? I, therefore, I urge you to imitate me. And that's, I, I, I tell you that as an interesting one, or, or like I told you, uh, uh, scandalous. Because remember, Paul was addressing a church who is so puffed up, who is boastful enough, who has issues of pride. And then Paul would tell them, hey guys, I urge you, imitate me. Isn't that teaching them to be more proud? Right? Like, I mean, that's the irony of what Paul is saying here. Remember, Corinthian church, aside from wrong theology, they're forming camps according to their favorite speaker. Right? Remember in chapter 3, some of them say, ah, I, I follow Apollos because he's a better speaker than Paul. No, I follow Peter, I follow Cephas. Some, some would say even, I follow Christ, right? <laughs> I mean, they're forming camps. This is a boastful church, No prideful church. And then Paul would say, therefore, I urge you to imitate me. Is he saying that, guys, if you're going to follow someone, follow me because I'm better than everyone else? Because that's what it sounds like, right? That's what it sounds like. So if you're going to follow someone, follow me. But that's not what Paul is actually saying because in chapter 11, he actually repeats this. He repeats this, but he makes it very clear this time what Paul actually meant. So he says here, therefore, I urge you, imitate me. But in chapter 11, here's what it says. Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. You know, ultimately, Paul is saying, here's what he's saying. Brothers, sisters, if you're going to follow someone, if you're going to make someone as your role model, make sure that they're leading you to Jesus. That's what Paul is saying. He's not saying that if you're going to follow someone, they're, they're, Make sure that it's, they're not making you to Paul's likeness. No. They're, that, that they're not making you to Peter's likeness. Make sure that they're not uh, making you to uh, Pastor Athan's likeness or your D-group's likeness, D-group leader's likeness 
or your ministry heads likeness. No, what Paul is saying, if you're gonna follow someone, make sure that it's not leading towards them, but it's leading towards Christ. That's what Paul is saying, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Paul is saying Christ likeness is the goal. Jesus is the goal. Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Now, before we proceed, this is a good time for us to pause and ask this question. Actually, especially here that Paul says this. The question is, can you honestly and confidently say to others, follow me as I follow Christ? I mean, just between the Lord. Can you honestly say, can you honestly say to others, can you honestly say to your wife who is with you right now, follow me <laughs> because I'm following Christ. Can you confidently say to your children, follow me because I'm following Christ? Can you confidently say to your boss? Can you confidently say to your employees, to your friends in school? Can you confidently say, follow me as I follow Christ? Is it really, I mean, the question here is, does our life really lead people to Jesus, right? That's, that's the main question here. Does our life really, there's an evidence that we are following Jesus. You know, the best way to help others become like Christ is to act like Christ. Let me repeat that. The best way to lead others to Christ is to act like Christ. So is your life leading you I mean, is your life worth imitating because it leads to Jesus? Right? I mean, that's a good question to ask. That's a good question to ask. And, and you know, preaching may be a powerful tool. Like this one we're doing right now, your small groups, your small group time, and preaching and study of the word, I mean, all of those things are good things. But nothing beats life testimonies, right? Testimonies that lead people to Christ. So is your life worth imitating because it leads to Jesus? No, there was a survey that was made before among young people, uh, elevate age. And, and one of the things that I found out is that many of our high school and many of our college students do not continue with their faith. They started off as Christians. And many do not also continue with their Christian faith and believing in Jesus. You know what's the main reason they found out? It's because Christian parents especially parents, Christian parents are not modeling Christ-likeness. You see, you can preach all you want to your children. You can say the right words. You can quote the verses that will scare them to hell. But I tell you, your life is going to be the one ultimately that will lead them to Christ. So, Okay, pa po ba kayo? Can you tell your seatmate right now? Follow me as I follow Christ. <laughs> Para ayo yun pag sabihin na. <laughs> if for some reason you cannot say it to your seatmate, that means there's work to do, right? And that's okay. And that's okay. All of us, you know, the good thing is we recognize that there's work to do and we know that that is where we're going. Right? Some of us maybe have gone ahead to be in Christ-likeness. Some of us are maybe falling a little bit behind, but, the, but, but that's okay. The, good, the, the thing is, you know that that is where you're heading. That is what's most important. Right? Christ-likeness is the goal. So, some of you, you are convinced, okay, okay, bro, okay ako dyan. I really like Christ-likeness. Sold ako dyan. Christ-likeness is the goal. Okay, okay ako dyan. But we're also left with the question, how do I know that I'm being Christ-like? Right? Is attending church Christ-likeness? Maybe. Is attending your D-group or leading a D-group Christ-likeness already? Well, maybe that's part of it. But what really does it look like? Well, that's the question right now. What does it really look like for someone to be Christ-like? Or simply put, what are the marks of a spiritually mature Jesus follower? What are the marks of a spiritually mature Jesus follower? In other words, are you becoming more and more like Jesus? Right? Are you becoming more and more like Jesus? 
And Paul, in chapter 4, he gives us a glimpse. Actually, he just gives us two, which means we're going to finish early, right? So he gives us two in chapter 4. But I know in all of Scripture, there's a lot more of this one. Like, for example, in Galatians, right? The fruit of the Spirit. That could also be marks of someone who's becoming more and more like Jesus. But for our context in chapter 4, Paul gives us a glimpse of what could this be. What are the marks of a spiritually mature Jesus follower? Here's uh, how Paul would say it. This is our identity. This is how you should see yourself, okay? If you're becoming more and more like Christ. He says that you are supposed to be becoming as a humble servant. And the second one is this one, as a faithful steward. A humble servant and a faithful steward. Now, I could just place here, you are becoming a servant and a steward, right? I could just place here, okay, marks of a spiritually mature Jesus follower, you are becoming as a servant, you are serving, and you are becoming a steward. But you know what? That, those words, those adjectives right there, very important. Actually, that's the most important thing here. No, it's not just about being a servant and steward. Everyone can serve. Everyone can identify themselves as a steward, but not everyone is qualified as what? Humble and faithful. And that is what's required of us. A humble servant and a faithful steward. You know, what matters to God is not really the doing, right? Because servant and, and, uh, servant and steward, that's the doing part of what we do. Is that important? Definitely, yes. The doing part is important. Otherwise, there wouldn't be things that will be get done in church, right? But what's most important to God is our transformation from the inside and then outside. So let's take a look at verse 1 of chapter 4. Here's what Paul says. Let a man regard us in this manner. Us meaning that's Paul himself, that's Peter, that's Apollos, you know, or, or Peter Cephas. What he's saying is that, you know, stop elevating us. Stop thinking of us as this lofty or either, because there are some critics of Paul, right? There are some people in Corinthians that would see Paul as up here, but there would also be some that would look down on Paul. And what Paul is saying is that stop doing that. So here's what I would like you to do. That's why he's saying let, let a man regard us in this manner. If you would like to think something about us, then think about this. That's what Paul is saying. Okay. So let a man regard us in this manner, then he says, servants of Christ. Servants of Christ. And uh, I don't know about you, but when I read the account of the early church in Acts, when I read just how they did really church in, in the first century, it would have been nice to be part of that church. Like, I would, if that would just go back, you know, that, that kind of church in Acts, I mean, it would have been nice to really be part of that church. Remember, this, the early Christian church in the book of Acts, they live in a very hostile environment, right? Like, uh, people are, 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 are out to destroy this uh, Christian movement. Jesus' followers during the time, they were considered as a cult, right? If, if not a cult, they're a bunch of crazy people, okay? Preaching that someone ro rose up from the dead. No, it's not highly, no, it's not very highly that how people would look at Christians during the time. And yet, you know, despite of what the world thinks about them, they love not only their brothers and sisters, right? But even the people that actually hates them and even persecutes them. And if there's one thing, I think, no, if there's one thing that really sets apart the early Christian church, I think it's this one. It's because they wholeheartedly serve one another. I think what sets apart the early Christian church is that everyone wholeheartedly serves one another. Take a look at this one in Acts. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common, meaning what they were doing was they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. They were serving one another. They're making sure that everyone's need is filled. And day by day, 
continuing with one mind in the temple. Tayo po Sunday na nga lang tayo nakikita, no? Medyo tinatamad pa tayo ng Sundays. Can you imagine this church? And day by day, at continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all of the people. Again, isn't that a church you would want to be part of? I would love to be part of that church. Right? I mean, that's, that, that could be the perfect church. Now, here's what I'm simply saying. The early Christians did not attend church. They were the church. The early Christians didn't attend church. They were the church. There were a group of people who were very active, energized body of believers ready to serve one another and of course to change the world and if we're going to be honest right now we have moved so far away from that like that's the church that once was we have moved so far away from what a church was meant to be we have moved so far away now by the way i'm not saying that what we're doing here is wrong Let's go back to what we're doing because that is, of course, descriptive, right? In Acts, I'm not saying that what CCF is doing is wrong or other churches are doing is wrong. Of course, uh, we also have to keep up with the pace of the times, right? We have to innovate as well. But if we're not careful, but if we're not careful, we will always end up as a church looking like this one. You know, when you go to a restaurant, right? When you go to a restaurant, you expect that people will serve you, right? Unless, it, of course, is, it is self-service, okay? But usually, you expect when you go to a restaurant that people will serve you. So, you go to a restaurant, okay? You sit down, you take the menu, and then you ask yourself, what's in it for me today? Right? What's in it for me today? So, what do you have for me today that I will be satisfied? And then what do you do? You wait for your order, and then you get that table napkin, right? And then they serve you whatever you have ordered. Okay, you sit down there, or some of you, you put it here. Okay, that's what we do. And sometimes, this is what church means for us. This is one of the hard truths, and I don't mean to offend anyone. Many of us who are here today, this is how we see church right now. You come in here Sunday in, Sunday out, you're going to sit there and then you ask yourself, all right, give me the menu, what's in it for me today? You might not say it that arrogantly, but, that's, but that's that, that's sometimes that's the attitude of many of us. Okay, what's in it for me today? And, and, and a mature Jesus follower has to move from this I'm not saying that you, I mean, many of us, we started with this, right? But you cannot stay like this. If you're going to be a mature Jesus follower, if you consider yourself to be a Christian or a true Jesus follower, it has to move from this. Sometimes you have to remove this, right? And you have, you're going to have to fold this one. And what you're going to do is you're going to have to put it here. You're going to have to stand on that uh, door. You're going to welcome people who are coming in. And then you will let them sit down and you're going to have to serve eventually. That is what a mature believer is. It's not always looking at the menu and asking yourself, what's in it for me today? And sometimes that is what's happening, right? In the church. So maybe this time, you know, as we celebrate our 39th, as we celebrate our 16th year as well in Baguio, you know, it's time, people, brothers and sisters, it's time to regain back what the church was meant to be. Right? Serving one another. Serving one another. And you know, there's always a way. There's always a way, I tell you. There's always a way if you are willing. There's always a way to serve if you are willing. But the opposite is also true. There's always an excuse if you don't want to. Right? There's always a way if you're willing to serve, but there's always an excuse if you don't want to. But I don't want to judge anyone. That's why I'm going to tell you that's between you and the Lord. 
because I don't know what the season of, your, of life you are in, right? Because there are some seasons of life, I know. <laughs> it's also difficult to serve. And I'm not talking about just serving in church. No, serving in the family, serving in the group. No, all of those things. So I hope that you will move from that, right? To actually serving. And in Elevate, there would be some students who would from time to time go to us uh, who would ask for advice. No? Some, some of them are struggling with anxiety. Some of them actually have depression. Uh, some have family problems and all. And you know, when you s- analyze sometimes, no, not really sometimes, but when you analyze all of these things that are happening to them, it's actually all rooted because they're always thinking about me, myself, and I. I'm not saying that their struggles are not valid. But it's just that it's make, they're making it difficult for themselves to find a solution is because they're thinking of me, myself, and I. And aside from biblical, of course, the, the, the consideration that we have to, uh, aside from the biblical uh, advices that we have to give them, you know what we ask them to do? Serve. We walk alongside them, okay, uh, is that what you're feeling? Come, come here, you serve with us. And I can tell you countless testimonies of changed lives because they begin to serve. They began to serve. It changed them from the inside out. Because what does serving do? What does serving do? You don't think of yourself anymore, right? You think of what? Who? The other person. You think of others. So what happens? The gravity of the situation that you're in, sometimes you parang halos na wala na yung gravity of your situation because you're already thinking of others. That's what's happening. And, you know, some of us here, maybe that's the first step. The first step is serving. Don't you know that we have a lot? <laughs> this is where the segue begins, okay? You know that there's a lot of opportunities wherein you can serve with us at CCF Baguio? There's a lot of opportunities. I mean, uh, there's going to be a sign up. Uh, table at the back later on. You can go ahead and look for these people that you see here. You can ask around who are these people, then we will explain to you what these ministries are, are all about. But the thing is, I hope that the Lord is really moving into your hearts that we could actually go back to what a church was meant to be, serving one another, serving one another. So I don't know if there's a, a ministry that you would like to uh, serve here. We can create a ministry for you. <laughs> if that's what you like, right? Just so you serve. We can create a ministry for you. Okay, now, this time, uh, I think, uh, I think they're asking me to change mic. See ya. See ya, brother. All right, so, uh, we have to remember though, we have to remember, it's not just about the doing, So it's not just about the doing and the serving in itself, you know. Like I told you a while back, it's also about being, uh, the being, you know, the motivation behind or the attitude behind what really matters uh, as well. I, I think okay na tayo, bro. Sige, okay na wag na tayong palit. Thank you so much, but, ano, reinforcement, thank you. So the Corinthian church, you know, uh, was full of skilled and gifted people. Like they were full of skilled and gifted people. They were willing to use their skills and their, and their talents just to serve the church. But the problem was, the problem was they think of themselves very highly. I mean, all of them, they want to serve. It's not a problem na parang you ask for volunteers. A lot of them may will be volunteer. It's like if this, this were the Corinthian church and I ask, uh, sign-up sheet is at the back, like everyone is there at the sign-up sheet at the back. That's how they were. But the problem was they think of themselves very highly. Actually, in Paul's words, he would use the word puffed up and started, and what they do is started to look down on people with what? Lesser gifts. They started to look down on people with lesser gifts. It's like they're uh, around the church and they were asking, you know, oh, what's your gift? Ah, uh, that's your gift. Oh, by, the way, by the way, mine's healing. Oh, what's your gift? Ah, uh, mine's 
That's their attitude. You get what I mean? That, that is, that's, that's, that's the overall attitude no? of, of the Corinthian uh, church. And if you take a look at that verse once again in verse 1, here's what it says. That a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ. You know that word servant right there? That's a very interesting word. Normally, what Paul would use in the original language is the word, in Greek word, doulos, which means bond servant. But this time, he uses a very different word. He doesn't use that word doulos for this, but he uses the word for the word servant, the word huperetes. Huperetes, which means under rower. Under rower. You know, in, in the Roman naval fleet, they have a ship called Tririm. They have a ship called Tririm. And these ships, it would have hundreds of rowers, of slaves. It would have hundreds of slaves as rowers in the galley or in the bottom of the ship right here, as you can see, right? They would have hundreds of that. And it would have three layers of rowers. That's why it's called a trireme. So it would have three layers of rowers or the slaves. And the bottom or the lowest part uh, of the slaves is called the huperetes, or which we call now as under rowers. It's something like this one. If you've watched the movie Ben-Hur, right? Something like this one. I mean, if you take a look at this one, in a sense, you know, this is not... Being a huperetes or an under rower, it's not a glamorous job. Like, it's not a glamorous ministry. No? This was considered to be the lowest of the lows among all of the slaves in that ship. And what Paul is saying, guys, this is us. Even those that you regard as the best speaker, he does this, he does that, that's your gifting, that's your skill, I'm only this. But what Paul is saying, Guys, we're all but this. We're all but what? Under rowers. And you know what's even beautiful about this analogy that Paul is uh, using as under rowers? Is that these under rowers or these rowers have to be in rhythm, right? You cannot just paddle all you want or in all directions. Otherwise, you'd be, uh, I mean, you will not go anywhere. You have to be what? In rhythm. If you've watched uh, dragon boat racing, right, in, in Olympics, there is this called drummer who actually sets the pace and the beat and the rhythm of how fast or how slow, right? They would go. And then this drummer right here, he is considered, of course, no, or she is considered as the heartbeat. He's considered as the heartbeat of the boat. And this, with the under rover, that's just a beautiful picture of what the church is meant to be. That's just a beautiful analogy of what the church was meant to be. Like, all of us, we're under rowers. We don't have the desire to be the big man of the church. Like, we are not climbing the ladder of success. Like, I am this, I am this, I am now a ministry head, I am now this, and I am not. No, 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 no. What Paul is saying is that we're the same. We're not climbing the ladder of success. We are not aiming for a better or a bigger platform or a better position we are mere under rovers and the beautiful picture is again this this is jesus right like he's setting the pace of how fast and how slow and all of these under rowers right there can you imagine this if all of our eyes are fixed and all of our ears are fixed on jesus right like everyone is rowing in rhythm and then we are going to be moving forward even faster, right? Even faster. And in fact, you know, Paul even pushes this a bit more. He pushes this a bit more just to make his point loud and clear, you know, just to address the pride issue of the Corinthians. Here's what he says in these verses. For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, take a look at the highlighted words. For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, what? Last, men condemned to death. Spectacle to the world. That means we are a laughing stock you know, of the world. Fools for Christ. We're a crazy bunch of people gathered together. We are weak. But here, you know, there's a little bit of irony and sarcasm that Paul is using here. We are weak, but hey, you are strong. <laughs> okay, good for you. And then, you are distinguished, but we are dishonored. I mean, can you see the picture of how Paul views himself and what he's encouraging us 
to actually view ourselves with. And if that's not enough, here's what Paul says. He says here, we have been made as the filth of the world, the offscouring of all things. You know, in other version, it says there, we are scums of the world. There is sometimes uh, a little bit of food that's left over, right? What, what Paul is saying is that when you gather all of that and you put it all together as food sometimes for the dog or for the pigs, that's us. We are the scum of the world. And, and just to be clear, by the way, no, just to be clear, Paul is not encouraging us to view ourselves as someone who has no value. No, that's not the point of Paul. Remember, if you are a Jesus follower, if you are a Christian, your dad is the king of kings. Your father is the Lord of lords, right? You are, a, as Paul says, you are a chosen generation. You are a holy nation. You are a royal uh, priesthood. And we are adopted children of the Most High God. And just to cap it, tap it even more, right? The one true God through the life of Jesus died for you and he died for me. So this is not a question of whether you have value or not. So that, that is not what Paul is saying. But Paul, remember what Paul was making a point to a people who are supposed to be the humblest of all people. Paul was addressing a people who is so proud but is supposed to be the humblest of all the people. But then again, they don't consider themselves as under rowers, but they consider them, themselves as what? Captain of the ship, right? And, and I believe the reason why Paul has to go to the extreme point is this. There is always a tendency for people to serve in a way that is not out of true, that's not out of pure heart. You might not admit it, but this is a reality. And it's always tainted with the guise of serving others, but in reality, you are serving yourself. One may appear to be humbly of service, but puffed up on the inside. This is the danger that Paul is addressing. And we all have this tendency. It's not just a Corinthian church. We all have this. Actually, what I want for us to do now is uh, do a mental checklist. I'm going to show you a little bit of a list here. And what I, do, uh, what I would like you to do is do a mental checklist. You don't have to raise your hand, okay? <laughs> you don't have to raise your hand. Just do a mental checklist for yourself, not your seatmate, okay? Just to be clear, okay? So the question that we would like to ask ourselves again is, am I self-serving? Am I self-serving? So this is for everyone. First one is this. Often think that your ideas are the best ideas. Some of you are smiling at me. I'm going to smile back at you. Because that's so me. I tell you. Okay? So, pwede nyo pong kurutin ng konti yung katabi. Uh, bahala po kayo. Okay? Ayan. Okay. How about this one? Easily hurt when corrected or when not considered. Yung hindi lang napakinggan masyado yung opinion or hindi na isama sa GC. Oh. <laughs> Alright, oh, sige. Sak saktan pa po natin yung sarili natin. Here's some more. Critical of others, gossips even to the point that they slander people just to get ahead. How about this one? Serves only when it is convenient or on your terms. Not sacrificial. Right? If everything works for them, then go. But if, if they have to adjust, then... Mm, Pwede po bang mag-absent muna? How about this one? Things that you are indispensable, irreplaceable, or the things or things will fall apart without you. Grabe, no? Yabang niya. <laughs> but some, sometimes, no? We have that tendency, actually. No? We, we can be arrogantly, no? At least in the inside, maybe, no? Or just oh, within our thoughts. How about this one? Not willing to adjust not willing to listen, not willing to apologize. How about this one? Keeps comparing yourself with others. Ah, 
sampu na yung disciple niya, kailangan, ano? Keeps comparing your ministry to other ministry or comparing our church or your church to another church. Dangerous. Very dangerous. Tendency to blame others when it's your responsibility. Siya kasi eh. Eh kasi ganito yung situation eh. But it's your responsibility. One last. Reacts rather than respond to situations. Reacts rather than respond to situations. Ang sakit po nung listahan, no? Ouch talaga. Lalabas po kayong duguan today. You know, this list right here, as you can see, it actually requires you to die to yourself and to crucify yourself, which is exactly what Jesus asked us to do, right? You say you're a Jesus follower, and that's what Jesus did, right? And that is what Jesus is asking us to do. You know, Jesus did not just ask us to believe him. That's part of it. Yes, that's the first step of it. But Jesus asked us also to follow him. Actually, what, in fact, what he said was to take up your cross and follow me. Right? So how are we doing with this one? You know, as Mark says, right? For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. You say you're a Jesus follower, you say you're a Christian, you're considering to be a Jesus follower, this is Jesus right there for you. This is Jesus right there for you. And you want to be a mature Jesus follower, then, as we have said, be a humble servant. Not just a servant, be a humble servant. Last, as a faithful steward. Let's go back to that verse. That the man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and what? Stewards of the mysteries of God. That word also right there is also an interesting word, steward. You know, in the original language, it actually means manager or a household manager, someone that take, takes care. So in our terms, maybe you're familiar with the term caretaker, right? Caretaker. Or you can also use the word as an overseer. That means that you do not own what you are doing or the, the, the whatever you're taking care of, you are an overseer of that. And again, Paul, by using this word, steward, he uses the word servant and also uses the word steward just again, no? To really address the pride issue of the Corinthians. And he gives emphasis on this one by asking these questions. He says in verse 7, For who makes you different from anyone else? You know, remember the Corinthian church, they have a lot of gifts, right? tongues and speaking and healing and giving and all of those things. What Paul is saying, hey, who do you think gave you that? Did you actually think that you're just so good? That's why you have those giftings. He's asking here, you know, a rhetorical question. Who makes you different? Like, who do you think gave you that gift? Who do you think gave you that blessing? That is what Paul is doing here. And then he proceeds. What do you have that you did not receive? There's the point. What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, this is the attitude that they have, why do you boast as though you did not? So Paul was reminding them, hey, brothers and sisters, we are merely stewards. We are merely stewards of whatever we have. Like you do not really own anything. You are merely entrusted by the Lord with all of these things that He gave you. You know, Paul was emphasizing that anything that you think you own, anything that you think you deserve, anything that you think you earned because you are so good, whether it be your money, whether it be your job, whether it be your skills or your knowledge, your education, your talents, your gifts, even your family, your children, your wife, your husband, even the very life and the air that you're breathing right now, all of that is from the Lord. That is what Paul is saying here. What do you have that you did not receive? Everything was just entrusted to your care. And if you move to that mindset that you are just a steward, here's what Paul is saying. Now, here's what's required of you. 
It is required that those who have been given a trust, you are a caretaker, must prove what? Faithful. That's why the point is, not just a steward, but a faithful steward. Now, this is a good time to ask also, are we faithfully stewarding the things that the Lord has given to us? Things, relationships, your money, your time, family, your life in general. Are we faithfully stewarding the, what the Lord has given to us? Or maybe another question that we have to ask is, how do I know? Again, right? How do I know that I am being faithful? Right? Like, yes, I would like to be a faithful servant, but how do I know? Now, many of you are familiar with uh, the parable of the uh, good and faithful servant or the parable of the talent, right? Some of you are familiar with this one, but for some of you who are not, I'm just going to read to you uh, some parts of it just to make my point here about uh, the faithful uh, steward. Talent, by the way, the parable of the talent, which is actually found in Matthew 24. I'm just going to read it to you. I'm just not going to post anymore. Uh, talent just means amount of money, a big amount of money. That's what it actually means. So here's what the parable uh, that Jesus said. Here's what he says. It is just like a rich man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. Okay. Now to the one, he had three slaves. To the to one, he gave five talents. That's a big amount of money. To another, two. And to another, one. Okay? Now, immediately, the one who received the five talents went and traded with them. And what happened? He gained five more. Right? And then to the one who received two, then he gained two more. Now, what happened to the one who received one? Now, the one who received uh, one dug a hole in the ground okay, and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. So there's going to be an auditing and accounting. So the one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more. Then his master told him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And then to the one who had two, same thing, right? Well done, good and faithful servant. But, okay, and the one who has received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See what you... See, you have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seeds. Then towards the end, here's what the master says to him. Throw out the worthless slave in the outer darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, like I told you, many of you are so familiar with this. Now, what does it mean? What does it mean to be faithful? Now, if you thought that the servants in that parable were being good and faithful just because they multiplied what they have given, then the Corinthian church should also be good and faithful servant. Remember, this was a well-resourced, rich church. They had a lot of talents. All of them are serving. So if the idea of being good and faithful is just multiplying all of this, then the Corinthian church would have been good and faithful, which is not the case, right? Which is not the case. Now, if you're thinking just because they multiplied, these servants multiplied what was entrusted to them, qualifies them as faithful, then you have been convinced by this world that that is what means to be successful and faithful which is very wrong if you think that they were faithful just because they doubled their figures then all of those who are making millions right now can i see who are making the millions right here okay no you don't have to raise your hand okay 
then all of those who are making by the millions right now are automatically good and faithful servant. And all of us who are making by the hundreds and only by the thousands, then you are going to hell. That's what it says, right? <laughs> because you did not multiply it. If that's, what, if that's what we think that this parable means of being faithful, if you think that the servants who gained a lot are qualified, are automatically qualified as faithful, then those who have 10 to 12 members in their D group, good job, Faith, a good and faithful servant. Then those who have one only, they have two, they have three, you lazy and wicked servant. If that's what you think, what being faithful means, right? Are you, anyway, are you seeing what, where I'm getting at? Are you seeing where I'm getting at? Well, here's the point, brothers and sisters. Being faithful is not just a matter of taking care of or multiplying what God has entrusted to you. Being faithful means doing exactly what God has asked you to do with the little or much that he has given to you. The aim is giving glory to God, not to yourself. It points people to Christ, not to you. That is what it means to be faithful. So are you doing exactly what the Lord is asking you to do with the little or much of the things and the people that he has entrusted to you? Because if you are good and faithful servant, that's what it means. So, let's assess ourselves before we end. Am I a mature Jesus follower? This, is, this, this will be a good... Uh, Discussion time, right? With your wife or your husband. Wag po kayo mag-aaway, ha? Points of improvement, right? Or with your children as well. D-group also, right? Are we being or becoming more and more like Jesus and being Christ-like, right? As a humble servant and as a faithful steward. Now, as we end, I have actually a confession to make today. I was about to cancel uh, I, I, was, I was about to cancel on speaking today actually. Because I really felt like as I was preparing this I was not the right person. That's what it felt. I was not the right person that you, were, you will hear this message from. Because to be honest, as I was preparing this no, for the past two weeks, I, it I just really felt like I was, I imagined standing here looking like a hypocrite. That, that's what it felt like. And, and as someone like me, or someone as you who handles the Word of God, right? someone who speaks here in front, there would be topics, right, that you are not confident speaking about. And to be, to be honest, this to me is one of which. Issues of pride, you know, humility, things like this ones. And, and to tell you honestly, my wife and my son would give a resounding yes to this. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that being a proud person is one of the things that I really struggle with until now. And, you know, prior to being a, in full-time, prior to being in full-time ministry, I was with uh, the academe. I, I used to teach in several schools and several universities as well for more than a decade already. And in hindsight, I was looking back at how I was as an employee, how I was an employee, and looking back as how I resigned from that company, the attitude or how I got kicked out. Yes, I got kicked out in some of the companies that I worked with. I was one proud and arrogant person. Like, like really. Especially to my leaders. Especially to my superiors. Superiors. Like I was one really proud person. You know the list we had a while back, right? The whole list? I would have checked all of that. I would have checked all of that. And, and many of you don't know, you know, during the pandemic, 
20, 2021, I, as, as I recall, or early 2020, there was a leadership crisis. There was a leadership crisis that we, that CCF Baguio uh, has gone through. Uh, I don't have uh, the liberty to tell you the details, but it was a mess. It was really a mess. But I can tell you right now is, I find myself once again, even as a Christian, even as a full time, I find myself once again involved there. No, I, I definitely had had a part. I, I may not be the central person, but I had a part to play there. But this time, you know, by God's grace, the Lord has really convicted me about my attitude. Na parang sabi niya. You've been doing this for the longest time. You're gonna do it again? Christian ka, di ba? Di ba Jesus follower ka? You know what I realized for myself? Here, here's what I really realized. Ronald, grabe ang yabang-yabang mo. That's, that's what I really realized. Grabe ang yabang-yabang mo. Really, Ron? That's how highly you think of yourself? And What I realized during that time was, you can call it a fresh revelation from the Lord, or an epiphany, how, however you can call it. But I just saw the ugliness of what pride can do. You know, I realized what, what I was doing, my attitude and all. I realized what pride can do to destroy myself and destroying the people around me in all of our relationships. That's what, that's what I really uh, I realized during that time. And the reason why I'm telling you this now is not just because I'm making an excuse just so I can qualify myself to speak up here. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this right now because I felt the need to be as honest as I can be. That yes, brothers and sisters, you have really have to pray for me that this is one of my struggles, this pride issue. I really felt the need to be as vulnerable as I can and as accountable as I can because the last thing I want to happen is to stumble any one of you here. You see me out there not doing a Christ-like speak about humility. The last thing I want to happen is to stumble any one of you here. And the last thing I want to happen is for people not to come to Christ because I wasn't acting like Christ. That's why I'm making myself accountable to you right now that you really have to pray. You know, pray for your leaders, not just me. Pray for all of our leaders as well. Pray for your leader in your D group. So if there's any one of you that I've hurt in any way as I speak this, we can actually talk about it. I, I publicly apologize. No, I, I, from the bottom of my heart, I really publicly apologize and I ask for your forgiveness. And we can also talk about it if there's anyone that I've really hurt. And I'm not making an excuse here right now. I'm not making an excuse. But you know, those actions that I have done that may have hurt you or the actions that people have done to you that have hurt you, Can, you, can I just tell you this? Especially from a Christian, if they're confessing to be a Christian and they hurt you. Can I encourage you to always put your focus on Jesus? Here's what Hebrews says, and I will make my point. Let's read of ourselves every obstacle and the sin which so easily entangles us. Let us run with endurance the race as Christians together that is set before us looking only at Jesus. Friends, here's what I'm simply saying. If you focus on people, you are opening yourself up to a lot of disappointments. If you focus on people, there's going to be a lot of disappointment even though they profess as Christians. But here's what I can tell you. Jesus, He will never fail you. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Focus on Jesus, the humble servant, and the faithful steward. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Father, for this morning. We thank you, God, for just the reminder. It's, it's, it's heavy, Lord. It's, it's really heavy, the message for this morning. But Lord, what we... But what we don't want, Lord, is just moving out of this place today, just feeling guilty and just feeling ashamed, Lord. But we want to move out of this place, Lord, 
encouraged knowing, Lord, that there is hope, oh God. That, Lord, we cannot really do this by ourselves, Lord. No matter how intentional we could be, no matter we do things, Lord, so that we can just have that appearance of humility, but Lord, you know our hearts, oh God. You know our hearts, Lord. And so, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, because it's only through that, oh God, that we can be transformed, Lord. Lord, we want to be the best father as we can be to our children, the role model, the father that will lead our children to Christ. We want to be the best mother that you want us to be that will lead our children to Christ as an employee, as a boss, as a volunteer here in church, Lord, we want to be more and more and more like Jesus, Lord. That's our prayer for this morning, oh God. And so, Lord, we thank you because you are a God, Lord, who is not out there to condemn us, Lord. But you have shown us, Lord, you have shown us this morning, Lord God, these are the things that we really have, Lord, to surrender to you and to work with you, Father. So we pray, Lord God, give us the wisdom, Lord God, to change, Lord, our ways if there are things that we need to change our ways. Help us to really obey you from the heart. Allow for us to become more like Jesus as a humble servant and as a faithful steward. So, Lord, we give you back the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.